Chapter fifty three of Mr. Sponge's Sporting Tour by Robert Smith Surtees. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter fifty three Pudding Pot Bower. We must now back the train a little and have a look at Jog and Co. Mr. and Mrs. Jog had had another squabble after Mr. Sponge's departure in the morning. Mr. Jog reproving Mrs. Jog for the interest she seemed to take in Mr. Sponge, as shown by her going to the door to see him amble away on the piebald hack. Mrs. Jog justified herself on the score of Gustavus James, with whom she was quite sure Mr. Sponge was much struck, and to whom, she made no doubt, he would leave his ample fortune. Jog, on the other hand, wheezed and puffed into his frill, and reasserted that Mr. Sponge was as likely to live as Gustavus James, and to marry, and to have a bushel of children of his own, while Mrs. Jog rejoined that he was sure to break his neck, breaking their necks being, as she conceived, the inevitable end of fox-hunters. Jog, who had not prosecuted the sport of hunting long enough to be able to gainsay her assertion, though he took a special care to defer the operation of breaking his own neck as long as he could, fell back upon the expense and inconvenience of keeping Mr. Sponge and his three horses, and his saucy servant, who had taught their domestics to turn up their noses at his diet-table, above all, at his stick-jaw and undeniable small beer. So they went fighting and squabbling on, till at last the scene ended, as usual, by Mrs. Jogglebury bursting into tears, and declaring that Jog didn't care a farthing, either for her or her children. Jog then bundled off to try and fashion a most incorrigible-looking knotty blackthorn into a head of Lord Chancellor Lyndhurst. He afterwards took a turn at a hazel that he thought would make a Joe Hume. Having occupied himself with these till the children's dinner hour, he took a wandering, snatching sort of meal, and then put on his paletot with a little hatchet in the pocket, and went off in search of the raw material in his own and the neighbouring hedges. Evening came, and with it came Jog, laden as usual, with an armful of jibbies, but the shades of night followed evening, ere there was any tidings of the sporting inmates of his house. At length, just as Jog was taking his last stroll, prior to going in for good, he espied a pair of vacillating white breeches, coming up the avenue with a clearly drunken man inside them. Jog stood straining his eyes, watching their movements, wondering whether they would keep the saddle or come off. Whenever the breeches seemed irrevocably gone, they invariably recovered themselves with a jerk or a lurch. Jog now saw it was leather on the piebald, and though he had no fancy for the man, he stood to let him come up, thinking to hear something of Sponge. Leather in due time saw the great looming outline of our friend, and came staring and shaking his head, endeavouring to identify it. He thought at first it was the squire, next he thought it wasn't, then he was sure it wasn't. "'Oh, it's you, old boy, is it?' at last exclaimed he, pulling up beside the large holly against which our friend had placed himself. "'It's you, old boy, is it?' repeated he, extending his right hand and nearly overbalancing himself, adding, as he recovered his equilibrium, oh, "'I thought it was the old wool-pack at first, nodding his head towards the house. "'Well,' spluttered he, pulling up and sitting, as he thought, quite straight in the saddle, "'we've had the finest day's sport.' and the most equitable drink i've enjoyed for many a long day oh bless us what a gent that sir harry is he's the sort of man that should have money i'm blowed if i were queen but i'd melt all the great blubber-headed fellows like this here crowdy down and make one such man as sir harry out of the hole on em beer they don't know what beer is there nothing but the very strongest hail instead of the puzzle one gets at this awful mean place that looks nothing like but the washing of brewer's aprons oh i humbly begs pardon exclaimed he dropping from his horse on to his knees on discovering that he was addressing mr crowdy i thought it was robins the mole-catcher thought it was robins the mole-catcher growled jog what have you to do with robins the mole-catcher Jog boiled over with indignation. At first he thought of kicking leather, a feat that his suppliant position made extremely convenient, if not tempting. Prudence, however, suggested that leather might have him up for the assault, 
So he stood puffing and wheezing and eyeing the blear-eyed, brandy-nosed old drunkard, with, as he thought, a withering look of contempt. And then, though the man was drunk and the night was dark, he waddled off, leaving Mr. Leather on his once white breeches' knees. If Jog had had reasonable time, say an hour or an hour and twenty minutes, to improvise it in, he would have said something uncommonly sharp. As it was, he left him with the pertinent inquiry we have recorded, "'What have you to do with Robins the mole-catcher?' We need hardly say that this little incident did not at all ingratiate Mr. Sponge with his host, who re-entered his house in a worse humour than ever. It was insulting a gentleman on his own Terry Tory, bearding an Englishman in his own castle. "'Not to be born!' <gasps> said Jog. It was now nearly five o'clock, Jog's dinner-hour, and still no Mr. Sponge. Mrs. Jog proposed waiting half an hour. Indeed, she had told Susan, the cook, to keep the dinner back a little, to give Mr. Sponge a chance, who could not possibly change his tight hunting things for his evening tights in the short space of time that Jog could drop off his loose flowing garments, wash his hands, and run the comb through his lank, candle-like hair. Five o'clock struck, and Jog was just applying his hand to the fat red and black worsted bell-pull, when Mrs. Jog announced what she had done. "'Put off the dinner! Put off the dinner!' repeated he, blowing furiously into his clean shirt-frill, which stuck up under his nose like a handsaw. "'Put off the dinner! Put off the dinner! I wish you wouldn't do such things without consulting me!' "'Well, but, my dear, you couldn't possibly sit down without him?' observed Mrs. Jog mildly. "'Possibly! Possibly!' repeated Jog. "'There's no possibly in the matter!' retorted he, blowing more furiously into the frill. Mrs. Jog was silent. "'A man should conform to the hours of the house,' observed Jog, after a pause. "'Well, but, my dear, you know hunters are always allowed a little law,' observed Mrs. Jog. "'Law! Law!' <sighs> retorted Jog. "'I never want any law!' thinking of Smiler versus Jogglebury. Half-past five o'clock came, and still no sponge, and Mrs. Jog, thinking it would be better to arrange to have something hot for him when he came, than to do further battle with her husband, gave the bell a double ring indicative of bring dinner nay nay when you have so long growled jog taking the other tack you might as well have a little longer snorting into his frill as he spoke mrs jogglebury said nothing but slipped quietly out as if after her keys to tell susan to keep so and so in the meat screen and have a few potatoes ready to boil against mr sponge arrived she then sidled back quietly into the room jog and she presently proceeded to that all-important meal jog blowing out the company candles on the side table as he passed jog munched away with a capital appetite but mrs jog who took the bulk of her lading in at the children's dinner sat trifling with the contents of her plate listening alternately for the sound of horses' hoofs outside, and for nursery squalls in. Dinner passed over, and the fruity port and sugary sherry soon usurped the places that stick-jaw pudding and cheese had occupied. "'Mr. Sponge must be, I think,' observed Jog, hauling his great silver watch out like a bucket from his fob, on seeing that it only wanted ten minutes to seven. "'Oh, Jog!' exclaimed Mrs. Jog, clasping her beautiful hands, and casting her bright beady eyes up to the low ceiling. "'Oh, Jog! What's the matter now?' <sighs> exclaimed our friend, reddening up and fixing his stupid eyes intently on his wife. "'Oh, nothing!' replied Mrs. Jog, unclasping her hands and bringing down her eyes. "'Oh, nothing!' retorted Jog. "'Nothing!' repeated he. "'Ladies don't get into such tantrums for nothing.' "'Well, then, Jock, I was thinking if anything should have ha, ha happened Mr. Sponge, how Gustavus J, J. James will have lost his chance.' And thereupon she dived for her lace-fringed pocket-handkerchief, and hurried out of the room. 
but mrs jog had said quite enough to make the cauldron of jog's jealousy boil over and he sat staring into the fire imagining all sorts of horrible devices in the coals and cinders and conjuring up all sorts of evils until he felt himself possessed of a hundred and twenty thousand devils i'll get shot of this chap at last said he with a knowing jerk of his head and a puff into his frill as he drew his thick legs under his chair and made a semicircle to get at the bottle i'll get shot of this chap repeated he pouring himself out a bumper of the syrupy port and eyeing it at the composite candle he drained off the glass and immediately filled another that too went down then he took another and another and another and seeing the bottle get low he thought he might as well finish it he felt better after it not that he was a bit more reconciled to our friend mr sponge but he felt more equal to cope with him he even felt as if he could fight him there did not however seem to be much likelihood of his having to perform that ceremony for nine o'clock struck and no mr sponge and at half-past mr crowdy stumped off to bed mrs crowdy having given bartholomew and susan a dirty pack of cards to play with to keep them awake till mr sponge arrived went to bed too and the house was presently tranquil it however happened that that amazing prodigy gustavus james having been out on a sort of eleemosynary excursion among the neighbouring farmers and people exhibiting as well his fine blue feathered hat as his astonishing proficiency in bar bar black sheep and obin and itchard getting seed cake from one sponge cake from another and toffee from a third was troubled with a very bad stomach ache during the night of which he soon made the house sensible by his screams and his cries jog and his wife were presently at him and as jog sat in his white cotton nightcap and flowing flannel dressing-gown in an easy chair in the nursery he heard the crack of the whip and the prolonged yep of mr sponge's arrival presently the trampling of a horse was heard passing round to the stable the clock then struck one pretty hour for a man to come home to a strange house observed mr jog for the nurse or marianne or mrs jog or any one that liked to take up mrs jog was busy with the rhubarb and magnesia and the others said nothing after a lapse of a few minutes the clank 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 of mr sponge's spurs was heard as he passed round to the front and mr jog stole out to the landing to hear how he would get in thump 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 went mr sponge at the door rap tap tap he went at it with his whip come in sir come in exclaimed bartholomew from the inside presently the shooting of bolts the withdrawal of bands and the opening of doors were heard not gone to bed yet old boy said mr sponge as he entered no sir snuffled the boy who had a bad cold been sitting up for you old puff and blow gone asked mr sponge depositing his hat and whip on a chair the boy gave no answer is old bellows to mend gone to bed asked mr sponge in a louder voice the charbon's god replied the boy who looked upon his master the chairman of the stir it stiff union as the impersonification of all earthly greatness dash your impotence growled jog slinking back into the nursery i'll pay you off <gasps> added he with a jerk of his white night-capped head i'll bellows to mend you <gasps> End of chapter 53